We all love an impressive performance on the field. And now, thanks to our latest sponsor, Pilot, you can have an impressive performance in the bedroom too. Pilot provides Aussie men with the clinical tools to treat bedroom issues like erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation. Not a fan of the doctor's office? Pilot is all online, so you can sort it out right now over the phone. And with free delivery Australia-wide, you can be back on your game in no time. Head to pilot.com.au today and get started. Play hard until the final whistle with Pilot. Aces, I know I always talk about the Rixies, but i got to offer you the discount again in case you've forgotten or in case you're sleeping under a rock. We have a special discount code for everyone that listens to this podcast or watch the podcast. It's Aces. Head online to rickseyewear.com.au and use the discount code ACES and you'll get 20% off. That's right, 20% off, one-fifth at checkout and free express shipping. So head online, rickseyewear.com.au and check it out. All right, do we have a big show for you today? Let's get stuck into it. Aces, welcome back to episode two of Only Sport. What a cracker we had last week with Joe Wispy Watson. What a man and what a few stories he had. Well, today we keep it in the AFL sector. Uh, That's right, the AFL sporting industry. This man next to me has traveled all around the world. And when we talk about sport, he's lived it, I don't know, I think 11 or 12 years uh, in the game. And then outside, a lot of off-season trips has met some cool people. So can't wait to talk to Hayden Crozier. Hey, welcome to Only Sport. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks for having me, mate. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Mate, we, we try to keep this about you at the start and then we twist it and we talk about you as a fan. Um, so speaking of Only Sport, I want to know initially what drew you to the sport of AFL? How did you get into it when you're a young fella? You know, when did you start? Where did you start? Um, talk us through it. Look, mate, I was I was actually pretty lucky where I grew up uh, in Roval on my street. I had probably five or six kids who were about my age growing up. So I was lucky enough to have them around and we used to play sport in the street growing up uh, sort of my whole life. So sort of just fell into playing footy. Um, Dad played footy back in the day. My brother was playing footy at the time when I was growing up. So he was two years older than me and I sort of just fell into playing footy and um, yeah, obviously started Oz kick when I was about six years old. Oh, so you did Oz kick about six? Yep. Did you get on the G as a kid? I didn't get on the G, nah, but I think I had Waverley Park. I had a stint at Waverley Park for a bit back in the day, but um, other than that, nah, I didn't get on the G, unfortunately. Do you remember like as a kid, like anything stand out when you're a kid? Like any memories? Uh, I think basically playing Oz kick, it felt like the, the field was massive. And then nowadays you have a look at the Oz kick field, you're like, that's pretty small. You can kick from one side to the other. But uh, so, certainly had a lot of great memories back in the day of um, playing Oz kick and sort of growing up and playing footy. It was a great, great time to be alive. Did you have to wear the helmets? I never wore a helmet, actually. No, I was actually a little bit kamikaze as well growing up. My brother probably didn't want to say this, but he he probably didn't go in as hard as I did back in the day. So, <laughs> hey, good old mate. A bit so, soft, was he? Well, he wasn't. Our friends at Pilot can <laughs> sort him out, can't they? They absolutely can, Tommy. But um, no, I was... Uh, I think I was pretty lucky growing up in the sense that my brother, his team was actually always short. So I'd always have to fill in for them as well. So I was playing two games a weekend and sort of had to toughen up pretty quick. Oh, I love it. When you were growing up, was footy the only sport? Like what other sports were around? Um, and, you know, what what other, you know, what did you take seriously when you were a youngster? Like were you playing, you played cricket as well? I did, yeah. Uh, growing up, it was always footy and cricket. Um, it was basically that from a young age. Uh, I was always more into my cricket than I was footy. Footy was just sort of a, a game that I played for fun on the weekends with my friends. Obviously, same as cricket, but I took cricket a lot more serious. Probably got to, oh, I don't know, maybe 12 or 13. I just started to fall in love with basketball, to be honest with you. So I think since then, basketball has probably been my favourite sport, footy second, cricket third. But um, yeah, I sort of had to get to a stage where it was about 15 or 16, had to make a decision whether I want to do uh, footy or cricket. And I'd never done a footy pre-season pretty much up until I was drafted. Really, it was always cricket in the summer and footy in the winters. So uh, yeah, lucky enough, it uh, all worked out well for me in the end. Do you think that's why you had a long like career? Because you didn't take footy so seriously as a kid, or you just yeah, you know, just the way it was. Uh, I think you need it. You certainly need a little bit of luck. But um, I was probably pretty naive going into footy. To be honest with you, we spent a lot of time together, obviously getting drafted together and and growing up over in WA. So I was a bit naive to everything really. Like I'd never been in a professional environment. Um, as I said, I'd never done uh, a footy preseason. Obviously, Rangers took it very serious. Um, and that was a great environment there, but I'd never obviously gone and done a full preseason anywhere. It was always, as I said, cricket and then footy. Um, and then 
happened to play some some decent footy under 15s, under 16s at, at rep level. Um, and then, yeah, obviously had to take it serious and, and was lucky enough to get drafted in the end. Let's talk about cricket. Just describe the player you were. Uh, I was an opening bat and a keeper. Um, I like to say back in the day, I bowled pretty decent offies. Um, probably the uh, the first bloke in my family to keep 25 overs, come over first, first over after lunch and get a uh, hat trick my first three balls. So There you go. Um, yeah, I like to think I was a decent decent tweaker back in the day. But, uh, <laughs> You're a squeezer and a tweaker. Yeah, a squeezer and a tweaker, that's it. But um, no, nah, definitely opening bat. A couple of offies. Keep, yeah, a couple of offies, left arm round, Daniel Vittori, you know, give it a bit of fly <laughs> yes. and that. But um, no, nah, I think with my with my batting, I, I like to be pretty aggressive and, and um, I'm sure we could ask my dad about this. I used to get myself out more than the opposition would get me out. I think I'd just lose the temper and try hitting one 40 rows back over mid-wicket. So but um, yeah, keeper and, and bat. And my brother played um, obviously a lot of cricket growing up. He was sort of in the Bush Rangers Academy and played Vic 17s, Vic 19s. He was opening bowler. So um, it sort of worked out all right that I sort of had to become a bat because he was obviously bowling in the nets flat out and would try to take my head off. So it was do always you, a bit of fun. Do you think if footy AFL that is wasn't around, do you think you could have potentially, you know, scratch the surface of all these other sports? Um, well, I probably think when I was 15 or 16, I would have been better at cricket than I was at, at footy. Um, but I just sort of f- fell out of love with the game, I guess you could say. I mean, I mean, I enjoyed cricket, but it just takes up so much time. As you know, like if you're playing junior cricket and then senior cricket, it takes up literally your whole weekend, every weekend in the summer. And then you play, you know, representative teams and that's on your Christmas break sort of as a kid. So um, footy was obviously the two hours on a weekend and then a couple of training sessions during the week. So I don't know if I would have gone all the way with it, but um, I would have given it a crack if footy wasn't there for sure. Love it. What about the sacrifices? Like, you know, when you're a kid, there's a lot going on. Um, I think it's worth sharing. Like, what are some sacrifices that you made that you still remember to this day that you're kind of pretty proud about? Um, Because clearly, you know, we all know what they are and what things you can do. But could you remember some moments in time where you were, you know, you had to say no to a lot of things and what you were doing um, compared to your mates? Mate, to be honest with you, I was pretty lucky because mum and dad were pretty strict on me growing up, so I probably didn't have as many opportunities to, to be able to rebel, I guess you could say. Um, I was always known in my friend group as the guy that would get picked up from house parties before people would get there, so I was never really in a, an environment where um, f- footy and the seriousness of footy was going to get taken away by house parties or anything like that, but there's certainly things, as I said before, with um, with footy pre-seasons having cricket the whole time, I sort of didn't really have opportunities to do a whole lot in in summer holidays and stuff like that. So um, there were certainly little things like obviously house parties, sort of going away with friends, going on holidays and that kind of stuff. But in terms of my training, I always felt like I was doing enough because I had so many guys around my age, especially where I was growing up, that were playing sport all day, every day. So that's basically what I did as a kid to enjoy it. Yeah, it's good. So you reckon like sport in summer kept you away from all the things that some people kind of go off the rails with, not off the rails, but we always used to talk about the easy path, the hard path. And, um, the easy one is to just, you know, carry on like a bit of a pork chop at 16, 17, where you reckon cricket kind of helped you and your parents. Yeah. Well, I think it was probably parents. Number one, like, as you know, you've spent a lot of time with a old man and, um, he was a principal. So he sort of had that sort of educational background, that educational focus, um, obviously didn't rub off, Jeez, off, on, me. What, what, what obviously didn't rub off on me too much, but, um, <laughs> It was always sort of in the environment where I'd always have to focus on like obviously sport and schooling and stuff like that versus going out and having a couple of drinks at the uh, under-16 disco or something like that back in the day, <laughs> mate, where I would have done my best work. But uh, no, nah, it was probably that. No, nah, very well, mate. Very well very well said, I should say. Um, describe a moment in your career that you look back on now and you think it was a huge challenge, you know, a real challenging moment in your career. And how did you overcome it? Because we love hearing these stories of adversity and, you know, you don't really talk about these things a lot. Everyone only hears about the cream and uh, the good stuff, but yep. just, you know, now that you've finished up at the moment, who knows, you might get a call, but um, you've had a great career. What was probably one of the most challenging moments you've gone through? There's probably two, Tommy. Um, my first year got glandular fever halfway through the season. Now, as you know, us two getting drafted together, we were probably on the lighter side of things with our body. Um, I was, I went in the system at 67 kilos, had to put a lot of work in to get myself up to a decent enough level to be able to play AFL footy. Obviously, was still unders with weight. Um, got really sick, missed the whole second half of the year, um, probably lost six or seven kilos and basically had to restart again. I think that was challenging because I'd made my debut a couple of weeks before that and felt like my first few games were, were quite decent at AFL level and um, 
had a, had a lot of fun. I had my first win in Melbourne against Richmond at the G. Um, you were playing in that game as well. No, I wasn't. Think, oh, you weren't yeah, playing. Yeah, I got in that. crook. Oh well, there you I go. I watched it on TV. I probably though. got it from you. That's why. That's yeah, I wrote it. I wrote every bump though. Yeah. Um, just just on that, sixty-seven kilos. You're lot. What are you now? Just so people understand. Uh, so I'm about. 87 now. Okay, 86, just 87. so people know the 20 kilo gap. Anyway, keep going. So you yeah, lost- I'll put, put on a couple this off season. <laughs> <laughs> so probably, yeah. probably 17 That'll or 18. That'll do when you're at Poppy and yeah. uh, in LA living <laughs> like a rock star. Don't um, talk about that. But um, yeah, so it was that was definitely challenging because I had to restart and put on that weight again. And as I said, I was I was quite sick. I got sent back to Melbourne for a few weeks and, and had to go again. And then probably the other challenging part, which is probably the most challenging part of my professional career was- it's probably really been the last two years, to be honest with you. My first year at Freo, you know, you come in as a young guy, obviously, as I said, got glandular, but you always know I've got a bit of time, like I'll be able to, you know, reset and go again, where the last two years, um, sort of being in and out of the team, um, being injured quite a lot, had a few sort of freakish things happen to me. Um, as you know, I fainted against Carlton at halftime, which put me back a little bit. Um, I had an AC reconstruction, uh, got knocked out. So there's been a few things that then... I think feeling like I was playing really good footy in the twos and wasn't getting an opportunity. So I think that was probably the most challenging part of my professional career, knowing that, you know, I've, I've, I've had a start here. I've played some really good footy. I was playing at the start of the year in each of the last two years, um, would get injured and then just couldn't get my way back in. So um, I think through those challenges in footy, um, I know footy's obviously not the be-all and end-all, but sort of when, you, when it's your job and you're in amongst it, all day, every, every day, it can get quite challenging knowing that, you know, you're trying to do everything you can to get back in the team and it's and it's not really working. But I suppose now that I've transitioned out of footy, um, you learn a lot of experiences in footy and how you deal with different situations that can really hold you in good stead and um, and how you can attack the next phase of your life. So um, I certainly wouldn't change a thing. Obviously, I would have preferred to play a bit more footy the last two years and probably would have helped with me getting another contract. But um, at the end of the day, mate, you know, there's things that you learn in footy that you can take for the rest of your life. Now, nah, well said. And you did get back in the team and you kept fighting. I'd love you just to dive a little bit deeper and tell me, like, when you are so frustrated and you, you know, you you start, you're in the team at the start of the year, which means you're in the best 22. Um, this is AFL for everyone listening, clearly. And you then get injured and then it's like, it's almost like your body lets you down and then you get back in and then you get another injury. Then you, then you really struggle to squeeze yourself back in. What are some of the things that you're doing mentally, physically, you know, just to make yourself feel better because you, you did overcome those challenges and um, in the moment, but what did you do? You know, what, what specific things did you do to keep yourself kind of sane, you know, without going mental, you know yeah, what I mean? Because we've yeah. all been there and we've all, like you said, you think about it, but what were some little cues that maybe some people listening and watching might be able to go, oh yeah, I might apply that to work when I'm getting frustrated. Yeah. Well, I think just initially from a broader perspective, I think I've always had a pretty good outlook, uh, outlook in the situation that I've had with footy and, and know that obviously um, very lucky to have done what I've done. Um, and as frustrating as it can be that you're not playing or you're injured knowing that um, – you know, you're quite blessed in a sense that you're playing footy for a living and it could be a lot worse. So I've always had a good outlook on sort of the position I was in. I think there's a lot of um, good contacts to the footy club that have really helped out. Um, psychologist Lisa Stevens was fantastic for me over my whole um, journey at the Bulldogs. But I was pretty lucky in a sense that you obviously don't want a lot of guys in rehab with you because you obviously want everyone to be playing. But, um, you know, last, sorry, not the season gone, the year before, I'd, I was with Mitch Wallace for a little bit of my Rehab, and as you know, Mitch, he's a fantastic guy. He's, um, his outlook on life's incredible. He's just such a nice guy and so supportive. So I was lucky enough to that when I was out and when I was injured, I had guys to lean on and um, and guys to really push me through rehab. Um, and I suppose when I wasn't getting a game, just trying to enjoy playing at Footscray as much as I could, there's a fantastic bunch of guys down there um, led by Edgy. He's a great coach and um, we ended up winning 10 on the trot and going all the way into finals and obviously losing to Box Hill. But um, just trying to enjoy whatever situation I was in and um, and know at the end of the day, if you're playing footy for a living, you're pretty lucky. So, um, yeah, as I said, as frustrating as it was, I think just getting that broader outlook of, of the situation you're in. Yeah, it's good. To change your mindset, don't think poor me, think an opportunity, yeah. a new challenge, um, support network, obviously – linking up with great people like Mitchy. It's good. It's good yeah. advice. Yeah. He's and a good man, isn't he? He is. And I think another thing on on playing the in the seconds as well is as you get older in the AFL system, I think it changes a lot more in, in terms of when you're young, you're not selfish, but you're obviously trying to think about 
what can I do to get in the team? I want to be playing every week. What else can I do? As you get older, it's all about um, trying to set up the guys that are coming through that next phase underneath you to be able to sort of hold them in good stead for the rest of their career. So I think I would sort of had a thrill just sort of playing with the younger guys and um, seeing them develop um, week in, week out, whether it was at training, just trying to help the fellow defenders or or the younger guys that were in probably in the same situation as I was. There was a lot of guys that were playing good footy and weren't getting a look in. So um, sort of just, just having that broader mindset and being able to look after them as well as yourself. Mm, well said. Mate, let's flip it. Let's go something more positive. What was one of the most memorable moments you've had in your career? There's probably a few, um, and this is a t- this ain't a time to get shy, Crosby. <laughs> but what's something that you know? When I just say memorable, individually, collectively, whatever. But what stands out to you? Yeah, um, most memorable moment is probably my first win, as I mentioned before, um, playing against Richmond at the G. It was my second game. Um, a lot of my school friends growing up are all Richmond supporters. So um, I, f- I felt like that was obviously a good situation to be in. Had all my family there, had all my friends there. So that was a great win. And obviously <laughs> playing at Freo, playing away, Richmond crowds are always pretty insane. So you always have that feeling where it's the 22 versus everyone. So that was that was good. And probably my 100th game against Geelong is another special uh, occasion. Uh, it was at home as well. Had family, had friends there. We're playing Geelong who sort of historically we hadn't played all that well against. They were sitting at the top of the ladder at the time. We were out of finals, um, had a great win. We sort of won by five or six points in the end. So they're probably the two ones that really stand out. Um, there's probably been sort of a few games here and there where I felt like um, early days it sort of catapulted me a little bit and sort of gave me a little bit more confidence in the way I played my footy. But um, they're probably the two main ones that stand out. I love it. feel like you've left a little bit of meat on the bone. What about what about growing up when you were getting drafted? There was a big mark that really put you all over the headlines. Surely that's one of the most memorable junior moments. Well, it probably got me drafted, Tommy, at the end of the day. But um, no, nah, that was a memorable one. I think it just sort of, as I said, like I never took footy seriously. And then I got to that stage of top age, under 18s, where that was my first year of taking things serious. And everything moved quite quickly, playing Rangers, and then obviously getting invited to Vic Metro, making the team, playing in that taking the mark and then the next week I was on the footy show getting interviewed from the crowd and stuff like that so that was um, what a PR campaign oh great mate my Facebook back in the day it was going <laughs> off <laughs> it was blowing up the friend request mate I, nine, remember, you rolled, I remember when you rolled in because you're pretty like you know pretty quiet and chill and uh, you walked to Vic Metro training and I think it was a couple of Eastern Rangers boys go oh here he is surprised his head fits through the door because they were a bit jealous I reckon because you were they were in the AIS and you were just oh. just coming straight from cricket training probably and you're taking <laughs> like mark of the you know the decade in t- in in the like I don't think there's been a bigger mark. I mean, I'm that's my been opinion. A few big ones, mate. <laughs> that, no, but in the in the under eighteen carnival, it's one of the biggest they've seen. They reckon. Yeah. I think the funniest part about that was the week after when I was back in Melbourne. Obviously, year twelve at school, I got a call from Tony Jones from Channel Nine, and he was chompers. Yeah, chompers. Big chompity big, chomp big, chomp. Big, top 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 top. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and he he called me, and it was obviously a number that I didn't have saved, and he was like, "Oh, we want to come out." to your school and interview you at, um, at lunchtime if that works. Um, we can get a lot of your mates to come in and we'll do we'll do a, a little interview with you. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. So we organised it and I told my friends the day and they couldn't believe it. They're like, mate, what's going on? We left class early, period four, just before lunch. And so we had to film it all at lunchtime and then obviously school. So you see like obviously all the news crews come in and stuff like that. And I actually found it, um, well, for starters, embarrassing, but it was quite uncomfortable because – we did it on our little oval, which was near sort of the canteen in the basketball courts at lunchtime. So everyone's there already. Then you get interviewed and you have everyone sitting there watching and people yeah. are trying to get background. And you see, we had a, a scene where we had to walk and sort of handball the footy to each other. And I was talking to my mates and it was like, we were just, I can't remember what we we're talking about, but all my other mates that weren't in it were behind the cameras and they're all looking at me, giving the finger. Yeah. Like, yeah. I can love to look at you, my girl. Yeah, putting yeah, you yeah. off. So. And you're on live television, so it's like whatever you say is on the internet yeah. forever. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah it's um, great. Yeah, it was, uh, that was certainly an interesting part to get used to the media side of things. But Good memories, though. Great memories, great memories. All uh I'll hold that that dear to my heart for the rest of my life, that. That's, that's what we mates. <laughs> oh, that's so good. A couple more on your career. What advice would you give aspiring athletes that are looking to uh, follow in your footsteps? Could be a kid from Roeville, um, could be a kid playing cricket that wants to play footy, whatever. But what? looking back now, you've had a great career. You've been at two clubs. Like you said, you've dealt with some adversity. You've you've taken hangers. You've, you know, you've, you've had a great career, played finals. What is some advice you'd give? Uh, some advice I'd give, I'd probably say sort of, I don't want to be cliche and say never give up on your dreams, but for me, things happen so fast. Like, as I said, I was 
always playing cricket, playing footy, but I never took footy seriously at all until I basically had to make the decision. So I feel like if you just try to get, always sort of live under the motto of just 1% better every day. So if you're just doing little things, whether it's footy, cricket, basketball, whatever you want to do, just sort of keep working on your craft. And I guess you never know when things can change when you're a little bit younger and all you need is the right person to watch one of your games and you might, you know, have a little breakout game where you might not be playing all that well. You do something right and um, someone sees something in you. And um, for me, it was probably, what, under 16s, I was playing a prelim against Glenn Waverley. We actually won after the siren. Dylan Orville kicked the goal. It's a great win, but um, Anthony Parker from Eastern Rangers, um, I hadn't really had any contact with Eastern Rangers at all that whole time and played pretty well that day. And then that was basically the first point of contact and then ended up sort of transition a little bit more and getting drafted. So probably a word of advice is just keep doing what you're doing, keep enjoying. I think if you enjoy it, you're going to get the most out of it. So keep enjoying it, keep working on it hard on your craft and you never know when things can change. To work hard and enjoy enjoy the process. Yep, enjoy the process, mate. There Trust the go. process. A couple of cliches in there. <laughs> we love it. We, we love, love the it. cliche. The last one on footy career, there are moments in time where you do have a lot of pressure, you know, pressure for spots, media, external, um, you know, whether it's even family, sometimes you feel like you're letting people down when you're not playing well or you are playing well and you have a bad game. You might be in the, the, the papers or the, you know, on TV for form, whatever, right? Yep. When you're, um, how do you handle pressure in high stake situations during a game or competition? So how do you block out all that external noise and just go to the game and focus? What are some things that you do that you could probably share with everyone that yep. helps them? Well, I think for me, back when I was playing, I was always just focused on my role and it was just role specific. So I never really thought about, all right, I need to get this amount of touches. I need to take a hanger. I need to do any of this. It was all about just playing my role. But I think you talk about those high pressure environments. I was probably someone who left speaking to psychologists and all that kind of thing a little bit later than probably what I should have in terms of I was always someone back in the day that would get caught up in how I was playing, how people would think of me. Um... As you said, if I played a bad game, um, feeling like sort of you let your family down, you let your friends down, and the thing is you never do because they're always going to support you regardless. I was very lucky. I had a great support system throughout my whole career, but I probably didn't utilise what was around me at the footy clubs more often. And I think once I got to the Bulldogs uh, with Lisa Stevens, I worked sort of harder on um, sort of if I did make a mistake, just being able to move on. And I think footy, the game itself, especially – at the top level, the, the speed of the game goes so fast. So if you make a mistake, just not worrying about it and just focus on the next moment. So I feel like it was always next moment, next moment, what can I do, how can I impact it, and never focusing on, obviously in the back end of my career, never focusing on what I didn't do right or what mistake I made. So that was probably the one bit of advice I'd say. Yeah, it's good. And what was she telling you though? Like how were you working on it? Well, it was basically that. I It was next moment, but I always had these little triggers and – Mine, it sounds weird, but it was always when it would go to a stoppage, I'd just stomp the ground, just one foot stomp the ground, and that was it. So guys have different – some guys sort of stand there and like to move. I know Easton Wood was always someone at stoppages. He'd never like to move. His cue was – sorry, he'd always like to move, never mean to stand still. So his cue was always, I've got to be quick-footed, I've got to move like that. Some guys might, you know, click their thumbs or something like that. Some guys might slap their leg and sort of just get them back into the, the mental state. And mine was always just stomp the ground once, all right, I'm good to go. It's good. It's good advice. It's uh, I was the same as you, man. I, I reckon I beat myself up hard. Oh, I mean, it was it, it does weigh on you, especially when you're getting uh, you're getting crucified for the mistakes as well. <laughs> yeah. You do start to eat into your own. Um, you start to worry about what you're like, what you're doing poorly versus like what you can yeah. do well. It's and, so hard to explain the mental side of things because you get to a stage where if you feel like things aren't going well and you focus on the mistakes you made in the game, you actually feel like you don't even you're not even out there. You feel like you're on autopilot. Yep. I, I always got the feeling that. I felt like I was just spectating and watching the game. If I wasn't mentally switched on, I was too worried about things. And then say you're not getting as much ball as you want early and you think, geez, I haven't touched it in a while. Yeah, there's a the lot ball of things. Come, yeah. The ball comes to you and you fumble it yeah, or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're having an absolute mare. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, I think the guys that have played consistently over a long period of time are probably the guys that are the best at just being able to move on and um, keeping things simple and stress-free, I think. 
Oh, very good. Very. We, we were stress heads back in the day. Geez. Well, it was a stressful environment, high pressure. We used to be pretty good when, uh, for our first few years. And yeah, you just knew that one mistake and you're out of the team. So yeah. you just used to, I mean, I used to blunder a bit. And I used to get crucified for tackling and ground balls. Man. I, I don't know. <laughs> 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 we had some, oh, geez, there's some head noise still. Hey, geez, there's some still head noise. Oh, no. uh, very good. Well, there you go. It's half time. That's a bit of only sport with Hayden Crozier on the field. We're about to jump off the field. This is where it gets a bit like lighthearted, a bit more fun. We talk about Hachi as a fan. But before we go, it's half time right here. Blow the siren, Brado. Are you a fan of going to the doctor's office? I am, but there's probably an easy way to do it, isn't there, Train? That's right, Crozzy. Pilot can help you with all your men's health needs. So, you know, especially if you've got a bit of erectile dysfunction, they call it ED. If you've got a bit of premature ejaculation, if you're going soft... Well, they make hard go easy. You head to pilot.com.au, check it out. And Aces, if you are struggling, head to pilot.com.au. Use our discount code ACES20. You'll get 20% off your first purchase. It's a one-time use only. But as I said, Pilot make it easier. You don't have to go to the doctors. You can just call up, book an appointment, and you can get all your stuff sorted online and sent to your doorstep. And it's all free Australian-wide. So speaking of Pilot... Let's think about a moment in time where you've had an unforgettable flop, a, a time where you've <laughs> flopped big time, Crossy, in a game where, you know, it's just not going well and you've compl- you've embarrassed yourself. Recount a time for me where you've had a flop on the field. Yeah, well, there's one that probably still haunts me, but we're lucky enough to win the game. So I mentioned earlier about playing Richmond at the G early days. We'd played Richmond at the G, I would want to say probably – for maybe 2016, 2017. Remember it fondly, Tommy. So we're up by four points with about 40 seconds to go. We've got the ball outside 50. I'm running back to goal to block for one of our keys, probably Tabs. Actually, Tabs would have been screaming at me. We know that for a fact. Running back to the goal, Dylan Grimes, right? As you know, Dylan Grimes, great defender, just focuses on his role. That's all he was doing. And he's bashing me when I'm running back to goal. He kept hitting me. He was grabbing me. In my head, I'm thinking I'm getting a free kick here. I'm a set shot of goal. Don't give it. So keep bumping, bumping. And I just had enough. So I've thrown him to the ground. They've blown the whistle. Reversal. 40 seconds to go. They've gone down the other end. Brandon Ellis, as you know, great friend of ours, Vic Metro, quarter cannons for you, snaps the goal. 10 seconds to go. Now, I remember after the game, Ross had said that when Brando kicked that goal, he's gone straight downstairs, had enough, lost the game. Little do you know, Tommy, center square bounce, balls tapped straight down to Neely. Neely runs, hits Dave Mundy 40 meters out. Goes back and kicks the winner after the, after the siren. Now that flop, if we were to lose that game, I probably would have been delisted on the spot. I reckon, Tommy. <laughs> so, thank you, Dave Mundy, if you're listening. Thanks, mate. Great goal. Loves uh, clutch, Dave Mundy. But um, yeah, that was definitely a moment in time where I felt like I was probably an autopilot for that last forty seconds. Because I remember when Brando snapped that goal. Tiger Army's gone up and I was just sinking, mate. Sinking, sinking, sinking. But there you go. So that, Grimes has flopped on you. Grimes has flopped on me, actually, speaking of the flopper. And uh <laughs> That's the, a the flop Cosby, and Cosby flopper. <laughs> and um and yeah, so that was a, a moment in time where that was definitely one of the big flops, but lucky enough, uh Dave Mundy has come to the party and save the day just like Pilot do, mate. Oh, they do, they do. That is outstanding. The flop from Grimesy and then David Mundy saving the day. Well, look, if you can't, you know, if you can't get it up, Crossy, you've gone soft. Pilot, hard made easy. Pilot.com.au. Check it out. And as I said, use our discount code ACES20 at checkout for a, you know, one-time use. You get 20% off and you'll get free shipping Australian-wide only. Very good. Now, let's jump to the third quarter, I guess we can say. It's uh, the third and the fourth, the second half, uh, thanks to our friends at Pilot, off the field. So only sport off the field. This is where we just spoke about you, you know, as a player and as an athlete, but now we get to have some fun. What sports are you uh, – sorry – now we get to have some fun. We've already had some fun, Crossy, but now you can probably relax. This isn't about you, so you can probably open right up. What sports are you in love with the most outside of AFL? So what are sports that you just you fantasize over? Like people fantasized over you when you were taking hangers for, for, for Frio and uh, the doggies, it, mate? It changes quickly, Tommy, I'll tell you what. <laughs> oh, mate, once you get the flick, the uh, DMs slow up. I'll give you the tip. <laughs> Absolutely. As long as you hold on to the blue tick, mate, that's all that counts. <laughs> Everyone can get them now, Crossy. You're gone. You're true, gone. The blue true. tick's not an advantage anymore. You look like a you look like you've paid for it. 100%. <laughs> Best real estate agent in Melbourne. <laughs> um, what sports are you in love with the most? 
So uh, I think now probably NFL is my favorite sport. I always used to be, well, not always, but uh, NBA was definitely my favorite sport for a long time there, um, obviously as was footy. But uh, I think NFL has taken over now. I was never a massive fan of NFL. I always used to think that it was a little bit stop-start, a bit slow. Um, Benny Graham, the great man, got me into NFL fantasy, actually, 20, 2018, my first year at the Dogs. And ever since then, as soon as you start knowing more of the players and understanding more of the game, just love it, love it. Love the red zone, mate. It's one of the- What do you love the most about it? I just think probably just the athleticism of every player out there. and They make it look so easy. Um and just pretty much how tough they are, like from a defensive point of view, and obviously, you know, obviously me being a defender, you see guys, how kamikaze they are, and um, which obviously doesn't help with the, all the concussion side of things, but just, um, yeah, how just crazy the sport is in general, I think is probably the, the best thing. And the atmosphere, obviously, the fans, the tailgates, pregame, college football as well. Um, a great friend, Aaron Norton, Buku Carmen's had a good time at USC, uh, a couple of frats, we won't talk about that. But uh, yeah, it was all, all you good You boys fun. are uh, on fire there, the USC Kings. Did you feel a bit old going there? Because they're a bit younger, aren't they? Did I feel old? Well, I was, because no, we've never done like a proper frat thing. And I thought, you know, I'll give the boys a, a, a decent experience and a proper American experience. Now, we've rocked up the front, obviously, three blokes, not knowing anyone. The, the freshmen at the door, geez, they look about 12, Tommy, I'll tell you what. They didn't want any more boys in, so I said, lads, look, there's three of us. We've got all our drinks. Here's 100 bucks. Let us in. And they let us in. They were fighting over the money behind us, and that's when I thought, oh, I'm in strife here. I'm going to get tall. But uh, there, was a lot, there was actually a lot of parents in there, actually, so I didn't feel as old as what I thought I'd be, but those boys. So were, how old was the guy on the door? Oh, mate, they would have been 18. Oh, really? Yeah. And, then, and it's like a full house with anyone inside. Yeah, so it would have been, anyone would have been ages, honestly, 18 to 60. 60 yeah. And everyone, it's all just like past players, past, oh, sorry, people that have gone to the college, yeah, so university. It was, yeah, it was homecoming weekend. So everyone that used to go to the university for however long are all welcome back and they all get And then in, in this frat, like are you bringing vodka and all that or it's all just in there free for all? It was all in there, but we had we had that many drinks that we had to walk. We were walking in, mate, on, on the shoulders. We had, oh, no beers, mate, all seltzers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Vodka soda and no doubt probably. Vodka soda and, um, yeah, but plenty of those and it was uh, all, all well and good. That's great. Oh, that's good. I nah, love it. Love it. What's the most memorable moment you've had watching sport live? Give me the detail. Where were you? What was it? Uh, I've had a few over the journey, Tommy. I had, uh, well, I've got LeBron this year actually just gone a couple of weeks ago. Lakers, Clippers, um, obviously strong rivalry. Lakers home game. Um, speaking about Aaron and Buku, um, they had an experience of proper, obviously, Lakers game before. It was Buku's first time in the US and Nordy's first or LA Lakers home game. So it's such a, as you know, it's such a different experience. It's, you get celebrities from all over the world going to the games. Entertainment's crazy. Game went into OT. LeBron had 40 and just turned, Tommy, he turned it on late. They I were down, did. they were down in the last quarter. They said, give me the ball and get out of my way. And he was just, mate, he was dunking on everyone. He was just posting up ISO on everyone. So that was probably that. That was, that was one of the, the most recent things, which um, were definitely a good experience. I've had, what was it 2021? New or oh, 2022 New Year's Day Rose Bowl. So that was Ohio State and Utah. Uh, 46-43. Uh, Stroud threw for five touchdowns. Jackson Smith and Jigba had four TDs, I think. And that was just a back and forth game. Literally the whole game. Um, atmosphere was crazy. So I've had that. I had a game where Steph dropped 55 against the Clippers. So obviously that speaks for itself. Hit That's like so 10 good. threes he was going off. So I've uh, been pretty lucky to experience some Big uh, sporting events in my time. Yeah, that's great. What about who's the coolest athlete you've ever met? Talk us through the experience. I know you've met a few because you've done a few tours. You've uh, you've even had Shaq give you a pump up, <laughs> mate. You've had a you've had a fair you've had a fair journey, and it's only the start. This is where it gets real busy now. What yeah. uh, who's the coolest you've met? If not, maybe a couple. Yeah, there was obviously a few. Um, meeting Steph Curry, I think, was a great experience. Uh, we were lucky enough to meet him. Uh, in San Fran 2015 and that was, he'd obviously taken off in his career, but that was at that stage, that was really when he was stardom, um, obviously still is, but that was really the start of him being completely dominant. Um, kicking the footy with him post game. I think that was probably part of the experience that made it so fun. It was just such a weird experience teaching him how to kick the footy. And he had his, his wife was there. All the security guards were kicking footies with them. And um, I still remember when we left post game, we had to walk through, um, the car park was probably 200 meter walk and then had to wait for a car to pick us up. And we turned around because we could hear all this commotion. We had all the security guards and staff were all kicking the footy in the, in the car park waiting for him to, to leave. So that was a pretty sick experience. That's so good. Um, 
obviously the Shaq won the TNT. That was that was pretty crazy. Um, Shaq, Kenny, Ernie, Charles Barkley, that whole crew. So that was. So what did you do? Like talk us through the day. Give us the detail. Like what you went on set. Yeah, we're on, we're, we weren't actually on set, but we were there obviously um, behind all the cameras filming it live. So um, it was through Hype Tours, Aaron Ford um, in Perth. This was obviously a while back, 2015. Um, so basically we watched, it, watched them live doing all their stuff and then it went to an ad break and Shaq looked me – so we'd obviously met him pre-show, um, sort of teaching me about footy and whatnot. And then, um, yeah, we basically went to an ad and Shaq had just pointed me out and he goes, what was your name again? I said, oh, Hayden. He goes, oh, sweet. And I was starting to get nervous because I was like, geez, I'm actually going to go up on set here yes. and it's just going to be weird because no one's going to know who I am. Like, what's he, what's this random guy from the show <laughs> doing there? Um, and I looked at one of the producers. He looked at me and he goes, oh, he's, he's good with this kind of thing. So I'm I'm shitting myself, Tommy. I'm thinking I'm going up here. Like, what am I going to say? <laughs> and then, yeah, he was just doing a recap of, uh, I think it was Clippers versus Denver at halftime. He was just talking about Blake Griffin. And then he just he just said he reminds me of my good friend Hayden from the Freo Dockers and then just started talking and I was sitting there going, what is going on here? And because I knew it was broadcast to Australia, I was thinking my phone's about to blow up here because <laughs> all, all my mates watch all that kind of stuff. And um, and then, yeah, it was probably one of those moments where it was like everyone was just a bit sort of gobsmacked in a sense. It was like, it's just so bizarre. Like, how is this even happening? Um, so, yeah, that was definitely another memorable experience for sure. That's so good. That's so good. Just on Steph, how do you kick it? Like, because every time you meet someone, you know, especially the Americans, and you give them an AFL footy, they're just like, what is this? They front punt it. They <laughs> don't even know how to hold it. Like, was he fascinated by it? He was. They're all fascinated on, like, bouncing the ball for some reason. They all think it's, like, such a challenging thing to – Because it's not to, round, obviously. Yeah, obviously because it's not round, but – once they get that out of the way and you teach them the sort of the basics on the ball drop, because usually, well, pretty much everyone that I've met, how we've tried to teach them how to kick, they just drop the ball dead flat like yeah. that. So they're just hitting it. And it's just floating around. Not so pushing it down. Yeah. Once you actually teach them how to drop punt, it's good. But I had a funny experience with, um, speaking of Antonio Brown, who, um, yeah, he's a bit all over the shop at the moment, poor bloke. But um, when I was teaching him how to kick the footy, he was just literally kicking the ball directly straight up in the air. Like we were 10 metres away and he couldn't work out that, you don't have to lean back. You have to lean forward. So every time he's going to kick it, he'd be leaning back, <laughs> just kicking the ball straight <laughs> up in the air. I think that might have been a bit of the CTE, to be honest with you. But, um, yeah. A few other things going on yeah, in that place, man. Yeah, big going on there. That is that is very good. For anyone out there that doesn't know, Cros cooked Antonio Brown breakfast at his house. Well, Dunks cooked it. I, I, I helped cut up <laughs> the like potatoes. Little, little, like little maids, mate. I don't know. It's one of the weirdest stories. Like, oh, God. I think we've told it before, but um, – you can. You should tell it again. You should tell it again for people that haven't heard. Just give them a quick rundown on like Antonio Brown's one of the greatest wide receivers, like one of the best that's been around. He's had a lot of issues off field. Doesn't play anymore. Um, I think he's rapping now. He's doing a few things. Oh. But Crosby, I think he got him at his just after his prime. I think he was just about to go to the Raiders. Yeah. And he burnt his foot and he was on hard knocks. You guys like this guy was at the peak of his powers almost. Um, and you're at his house in Miami cooking in brekkie? Yeah, it was it was definitely a weird setup on how it all began. Cause so we were in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, I was with Josh Dunkley and my friend Cam. And I was meeting, I was actually meeting my brother in Miami. That was a few days later. But um, a friend of Dunks, uh, Jamie Hepner, who was uh, the GPS guy, I think at uh, Vic Country when Dunks was going through the the ranks there. He'd message Dunks and he said, oh, are you guys going to Miami at all? And Dunks said, oh, we're actually, like, funnily enough, we're actually going tomorrow. And he said, oh, do you want to train with Antonio Brown? And when Dunks told me that, I was like, oh, well, obviously we're going to do it. Like pretty much the best, one, of, one of the best wide receivers of all time. So Jamie was like, yep, like this is his number. Um, we're going to meet at this oval in Hollywood, Florida, which is about 40 minutes north of Miami. Um, be there at 9 a.m. You're going to train with him for a couple of hours, sort of do whatever you want. You can you know, run routes with him, defend him, whatever you want to do. And then he's going to have, a, 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 you know, his trainer with him, a couple of his crew, I guess you could call it, and that's about it. So we said, yep, no drama's all good. We booked in the date. On our way, we get to the ground quarter to nine, so 15 minutes early. Um, as you know, yeah, you know, with the American athletes, sometimes they can be a bit all over the shop in terms of their timing and whatnot. So, um, yeah, got to nine o'clock. He wasn't there. We started, sort of started to warm up. We were still sort of near our car. Got to quarter past nine, not there, 9.30, not there, 9.45, what's going on here? So Dunks messaged Jamie and said, oh, is he coming? And he said, "He's just. I was just got off the phone with him. He wants you to come to his house. He wants to train at midday, the hottest time of the day. Obviously in Miami, it's it's pretty hot and humid. Um, he wants just to hang with his family at the house until 12 and train. So we're like, okay. So went there, got to the obviously gated community, got to the front. Um, security was like, oh, can I help you guys? And we're like, oh. 
we're here for Antonio Brown. He just looked at us like, what the fuck are these blokes talking about? So he's called him. He's like, yep, yep, let him through. So rocked up to his house. Man, what do I mean? 12 bedroom, 10 bathroom, just as big as you can imagine it to be. Like obviously cars, like Lambos in the front, everything. So it's just all over the shop. Um, Get there just talking about just his life and everything and um, – he was supposed to have his chef there. His chef was sick. I reckon that was the reason why he got us over, just because he wanted us to cook him breakfast. <laughs> Probably didn't know how to cook it himself. Um, so we just all had breakfast together, went and trained for two hours, came back, and he, we literally just spent the day at his house until about six o'clock at night and left. Like, just Was he a nice guy? Yeah, really nice. That's why it was – bit shattering to see what's happened afterwards, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was like it was in a real weird sort of situation at that stage because we saw him, everything was all well and good. Like he had a bit of stuff going on football-wise, but sort of outside of that, it was all it was all smooth and, and everything was all good. And then sort of two weeks after it, a couple of things happened to him and then it's sort of basically been a downward spiral since. So it's pretty sad to see, but, um, yeah, hopefully he can sort himself out. But that was uh, – that was a pretty cool experience, that one, for sure. Man, when you guys put up a video, like, I just want everyone out there to understand whatever sport this is, this is one of, like, you know, big, one of the biggest names, and you just got a mate. And I don't think you were that big on NFL, you know, how much I loved it. Yeah, I think this yeah. all these experiences would have turned you, but you just put up an Instagram video, like, real subtle, like, just playing corner cornerback yeah. on Antonio Brown at practice. And I'm like, have I... Am I seeing what yeah. I saw? Like, what is going on here? And then you go, next story, like you're in the kitchen with him cooking scrambled well, dunks, is cooking scrambled eggs, yeah. and you're probably, you're on the content. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? And it's like, these are the experiences. They're that good. Like, only sport classics, this one. Like, yeah. that is a great story. So I remember when we were, when we were cooking breakfast, he said to Dunks and I, he goes, oh, look, what are you, like Instagram handles? And I was like, yeah, well, gave him the Instagram handles. And then he was filming us <laughs> cooking brekkie. And he put it on his story, but I knew in my head, I was like, well, we're going to train with him after. We're probably going to have some content with him and stuff. So I'm not going to put up anything until until that's all done. And um, so this was, what, 9 o'clock in the morning. So it would have been like 1 a.m. probably in Melbourne. I knew no one would have been away. But obviously got a few mates in um, in the States I met over the years. So he'd put it up. I hadn't reposted anything, but I had a few messages people saying, I couldn't believe what I was seeing because they all follow <laughs> yeah, Antonio Brown. Right. He put it up first, yeah, didn't like, he? What, like, what is going on? I couldn't <laughs> believe what I was looking at. And then I remember when we were going to the – so when we just got to the ground, um, I'd taken a, a photo of him and Dunks and I'd send it to um, a couple of mates and I'm like, stay tuned. And they're like, they couldn't believe what was going on. So Yeah, that's right. I remember Antonio Brown shared you boys on his story and then you guys hadn't reshared or anything and everyone's like – the fuck is yeah, going yeah, on we're here? Yeah, around a little bit, I reckon, and everyone was like, what the fuck? I know our about? NFL group, I only had one at that time, I'm about three or four now, but there was like, has anyone anyone else got any context to this? I yeah. think that's when I was like, let me find out what's going on, and you're off the phone until like later on. Yeah. Great yeah, story. Um, mate, a couple more to go. Uh, if you created your own TV show and you had to create a pilot episode, you know, our friends at Pilot will love that. Remember, hard made easy. Uh, and... It was around the greatest sporting events in the world. Um, where would you attend and film content for and, where you know, what would you do and why? So, what, you know, essentially if you've seen Getaway, you know, a TV show, whatever, you got to create a pilot on all your experiences to make it a really fun show. Wh where's some places that you think you would film to showcase some of these great sporting events? Well, I think if I was starting it today, I'd probably go straight to Vegas for the Super Bowl next year. I think that would be a good start. Um, obviously, major event. Um, crazy city. So I think it depends what type of rating you want your content, Tommy, because you, well, could, you could film a lot of content in Vegas. You could film a, not, a lot of nightlife stuff, um, a few other things. Well, that, it needs to be on television. So I'd imagine it needs to be about PGM. Oh, you could do a little bit of nightlife stuff, but I think that you could, you'd could you be able to mix it in pretty well with that whole build up of the event. Um, it'd be a crazy event to begin with, obviously having Super Bowl there. I think Vegas itself probably would have learned a few things with the F1 that had just happened. Um, obviously, I wasn't there, but I've heard a few things sort of in the build-up of what sort of the city and what F1 probably could have done a little bit better to make it a bit of an easy experience. So I guess that they've had that event just before this Super Bowl. So I think they'll learn what didn't go right with the F1 and what will go right with that. So would definitely do that. And then I think I'd just go straight into NBA Finals, whatever team makes the NBA Finals. That would probably be the two biggest ones, I think. And then you could potentially even just go into the World Series of Baseball as well. You could spread it out over a couple of months. You could do the World Series of Baseball, which has just happened. Um, you could go straight into Super Bowl and 
Um, was it end of Jan or Feb? Is it? Or is it later? It's probably Super Bowl's later. Bowl's start of Feb. Start of Feb, yeah. I think it's 8th to 14th is the week. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think. And then you go pretty much straight after that into NBA finals. So you probably do three on the trot. I reckon you'd get a fair few viewers I out love of that. that. I would love to see a, an episode um, pilot on the Super Bowl and the NBA finals. Well said. Right, who's the greatest athlete of all time in your opinion? Only one. I don't want any gray area. Oh, this, that. One name. Jordan. I think. Why? Well, obviously with what he's done on the court, his personal achievements, his team achievements, how many championships he's won. And then I think being able to, to change that into the Jordan brand, making whatever he's making. I don't even want to know what he's making per year on that. But I think you go from his sporting career, which obviously everyone in the world would know who Michael Jordan is for starters, which I'm sure if you put a list of top 10, I'm sure everyone would know pretty much everyone on that list anyway. But to then transition from an amazing sporting career, which, I mean, p people are obviously debating whether it's Jordan or or LeBron at the moment, um, but I obviously didn't see the majority of uh, Jordan, but from what I've seen and then from what I've heard and what I've read, I'd say he'd be number one and then a guy that's changed his brand into one of the biggest sporting brands in history as well. I don't think anyone else has done that. So Yeah, love it, love it. And that's the thing, greatness – in your opinion, isn't just measured on the court, it's off the court. Yeah. LeBron's doing some amazing things off the court. And obviously he'd be in the, in the discussion, but yep. it's a great question. Who is the GOAT? Um, and that's in the world, by the way. There's yep. a, you know, there's soccer fans out there. There's there's other fans. Very good. Righto. Last one. Our friends here at Rick's, we've just dropped some new sunnies, Crossy, as always. Everyone, aces out there. Rick'sIwear.com.au. You use the discount code ACES and you get 20% off and free express shipping. I know you love your Claytons. They're back in stock, brother. Clayton so I've got trick. you the Crystal Claytons, mate. Beautiful. They're all yours. If you want to look like Crozzy, as I said, rickshighway.com.au and use our discount code ACES at checkout. You get 20% off and free express shipping. Last question. Lunch outdoor with the Ricks on for three. You have to cut one to keep two. These are the names. David Beckham, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady. Who are you taking to lunch with you and your Ricks on? Tommy, it's a tough decision, mate, but uh, I would take Jordan and Beckham, I think. I probably don't have a reason why I wouldn't do Brady, but I think coming off watching the Beckham doco, which is just obviously aired on Netflix, um, incredible story, incredible life he's lived. Obviously, they all have. Um, and then I think Jordan purely because I think he's the greatest athlete of all time. Um, Brady's obviously the, the best NFL footballer of all time, I believe, best quarterback. But uh, yeah, I'd say those two. It'd be a there'd be a few stories getting around. I reckon. Oh, it would be. There would be. I'm sure. So Brady's stiff. Brady is stiff, but um, I think Brady. If we're talking, talking pure stories, Tommy, I reckon Brady would have been more on the straight and narrow than those two. So the Patriot way, Patriot way, um, Bill Belichick way. So I think. Uh, Purely based off stories, I feel like you'd probably get more out of Beckham and Jordan. Do you I think like. Jordan would be a bit intimidating? He would be, but I think just being able to say that you've had lunch with the greatest of all time would be that in <laughs> itself, I think. That is so good. And what would be one question you'd ask both of them? One question I'd ask both of them. I'd probably just ask them what their, what their best off-field stories are first, I reckon. <laughs> that have great on-field stories, but I think I'd just ask about that. Like if I was if I was probably to ask, if I was probably to catch up with them for lunch 10 years ago, I would have asked them sort of different ways they went about their career and what I could learn out of it. But I think now that footy's done for me and I'm moving on to the next phase of my life, Tommy, I think um, the off-field uh, stories would be the number one, I reckon. Oh, pretty good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Mate, so good. Thank you so much for your time. Episode two of Only Sport. We hope you're enjoying our brand new series, um, a series where we just dive into sport, whether it's the athlete's journey or the uh, the fan uh, side of things. We hope you're really enjoying it. Again, thank you to our friends at Pilot. Uh, head online. As I said, no need to go to your doctor's office. You can just call up online via your phone, book an appointment, use our discount code ACES20. You get 20% off your first order. Um, and it's free shipping Australian-wide. Crozzy, you've been outstanding, brother. Enjoy Thank the you, brother. Rixies. Let's hope the Wait, sun comes out in Melbourne oh, soon. Can't guarantee <laughs> that, but we'll do it. And, uh, mate, thank you so much for your time, your stories, and all the best with uh, what's to come. Who knows? The phone might ring. You never know. Never you never know. know. Mate, you never um, know. Hang in there and, uh, yeah, looking forward to what happens next. Cheers, Aces. Appreciate your support. Uh, as always, leave a comment. 
like, subscribe. It all helps. Send this uh, on to some friends that you think would really enjoy. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week for episode three of Only Sport. One more time because I really mean it. I just want to say a massive thank you for all the support you continue to give us at the Oz American Aces. If you want to further support us, make sure you like and subscribe, hit the follow button so you can keep up to date with all our exciting shows and announcements. Righto, now it's time to give our sponsors a massive plug. Struggling to make it to third base before striking out? Wood not driving like it used to? Let me guess, tackle's gone a little bit soft? No stress. If you're having issues in the bedroom, like erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation, Australia's favourite men's healthcare provider, Pilot, has all the clinical tools you need to get your game back on track. Thousands of Aussie men come to Pilot to get simple, discreet and clinical treatments online. Pilot has free shipping, auto refills and free follow-ups over text with practitioners. Get started today at pilot.com.au and remember, play hard until the final whistle with Pilot. Aces, I know I always talk about the Rixies, but i got to offer you the discount again in case you've forgotten or in case you're sleeping under a rock. We have a special discount code for everyone that listens to this podcast or watch the podcast. It's Aces. Head online to rickseyewear.com.au and use the discount code Aces and you'll get 20% off. That's right, 20% off, one-fifth at checkout and free express shipping. So head online, rickseyewear.com.au and check it out.